Well, good evening. Why don't you go ahead and take your Bibles and go ahead and open it up to first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, Pastor Hector has already read our, our text for this evening, but I believe it would be wise for us to go ahead and put our eyes back onto it so we know exactly what the Lord would have for us. And as you guys are turning there, I want to thank you. Over the past two weeks, I've had a flood of emails and calls and text messages, uh, people coming inside of my office, poking their heads in, grabbing me uh, in the hallways, and just letting me know that you've been praying for me. And I can't explain to you how thankful I am for that, knowing that the people of our church is praying for, for me. So thank you for that. So, with our hearts prepared, please join me in standing as we read the Holy Word of God. Now, Pastor Hector has already read 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 21. I want to read verse 21, as that will be our vocal point for this evening. The Apostle Paul writes, For our sake. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's pray. Lord, we desperately need your help this evening. Father, as we open up your word where we try to understand exactly what Paul is telling us here through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, you give us that help, Lord. Give us wisdom and give us understanding. Govern our thoughts and our minds this evening, Lord, as we direct our attention upon the cross, upon Christ, and upon your word. In your name, amen. You may be seated. In 1956, five American missionaries traveled to the country of Ecuador with the sole purpose of bringing the gospel to a tribe who had actually never even heard of the name Jesus Christ. More than likely, most of you probably know this story. This is the story of Nate Saint and Jim Elliott. Now, these two brothers, as well as three other brothers, they were trying their best in efforts to, to, to preach the gospel of Christ. They were flying their plane over this tribe. They were dropping off gifts to this tribe, all in efforts of trying to be able to make contact with them. And one day, they found a, a river, and it had a, a, a large enough bank where they could be able to land their plane. That's what they did. Upon them landing their plane and getting out of the plane, this tribe killed all five men. Now, two years later, the wife of Jim, Elizabeth Elliot, she continued to pursue this tribe. She continued to teach them about how they could be forgiven of their sin. And to the glory of God, a revival seemed to break out with this, within this tribe. Many of these men who actually helped participate in killing Jim Elliot was born again. Now to fast forward just a few years later, we find that one of these men who was born again actually planted a church inside of this tribe. He became the pastor of this church and really believe it or not, he baptized the son of Nate Saint, one of these five missionaries in the very river where Nate Saint was murdered. It's an amazing illustration of restoration. And really, this is what the Bible explains to us as to what reconciliation actually is. And tonight, we're going to study recon reconciliation. We're going to see exactly how God reconciles us. I want to consider a sermon that I've simply entitled Reconciliation. In our time together, we're going to see the greatest act of reconciliation that the world has ever seen. And it happened on the cross of Christ nearly 2,000 years ago. And I believe in our verse here this evening that we're going to find two different elements that the Lord would have for us as we understand how God completes this reconciliation between us and himself. First, we need to consider the work of God. The work of God. The first element that we see 
is, is, is seeing how the Lord is, begins to work these things out. And I really believe that there is no other verse inside of the Bible that really points to what Paul is trying to tell us, how God reconciles. The first half of verse 21, we see two different pronouns. We see him and we see he. Well, we need to understand who these two are. So first let's look at he. Who is he? And to properly understand who he is, we must go back to the preceding verses that Pastor Hector has already read for us. So verses 17 through 20, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors to, for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So the, the he here is none other than God the Father. Now the, the verses that are proceeding here that we just read are beginning to explain how God's plan of salvation is going to happen. We're going to see exactly how God does it and how does God begin to save sinners. Well, it's right here in verse number 18. It's through the ministry of reconciliation. So how can we define or how can we describe this word of reconciliation? Well, I believe a good definition for us this evening is the restoration of relationships and of peace where before there had been hostility and alienation. Now, you and I can very easily see by just turning on the news or really just looking into our culture, we can easily see that there is still alienation between God and man, and there's still hostility between God and man. Because of the sin of Adam, Paul can rightly say in Romans chapter 3 that no man is righteous, that all are bent towards evil, and that none are actually even seeking for God. Now, if, if what Paul says is true and that we are not actually seeking after God, then it makes no sense that we can have God reconciled to us. Rather, it has to be flip-flopped. We have to understand that God is the one who does all of the work. We have to understand that it is God who reconciles us to him. We must understand that he completes the job of reconciliation. That's exactly what we see in verses 18 and 19. To sum it up, it says that God through Christ reconciled us to him. So if in these verses Paul is explaining how he's going to be able to save sinners, and that's through reconciliation, the verse 21 logically then explains how God will reconcile, or rather another way we could say it is the process of how reconciliation is going to work. So with that in mind, we need to go back to our verse. So we've identified the he, and that's God the Father. Who is the him? Who is him? Well, reading on, it says, He made him to be sin who knew no sin. The only rational answer here is that it could be Christ. For there is no being who ever lived that did not, that does not, that knows not sin. And the Bible is dripping with evidence, proclaiming the impeccability of Christ or the sinlessness of Christ. We find in John 8, 46, Jesus challenged those whom he was speaking with and he said, which one of you convicts me of evil? Luke 23, 4 says, uh, speaking of Pilate, and he repeatedly affirmed his innocence and he said, I find no guilt in this man. Luke 23, 41, the criminal on the cross who finally believed rebuked the other criminal and he said that this man has done no wrong. The apostles of Jesus who followed Christ for three whole years, examining his life closely, also testified to the sinlessness of Christ. Acts 3, 14 tells us that Peter was preaching a sermon and he even referred to Christ as the holy and the righteous one. Even the author of Hebrews wrote in the fourth chapter of his book saying that we have a great high priest who is tempted in all ways yet was without 
sin. So the evidence really is overwhelming as to what the Bible gives us to show us that Christ never knew sin, but yet our verse here this evening tells us that the Father made Christ sin. What in the world does that mean? First, let's examine exactly what it does not mean. It does not mean that Christ was made a sinner. It does not mean that Christ violated any law. How could God make any man whose eyes are too pure to approve evil, how could he make any man, let alone his son, a sinner? It doesn't make sense. So how did Christ become sin? Well, what happened is that upon our faith in in Jesus Christ, he took our sin and he went and he placed it onto the shoulders of Christ. He took our sin off of us and he placed it upon Christ. Christ became our substitute. He became our representative. At that point, Jesus took upon himself our guilt. He took upon himself our shame. And he took upon himself our sin. Now to truly understand exactly how Christ was made sin, we should direct our attention to the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, we find this very popular section of scripture. We find exactly how God is making Christ to be sin on our behalf. Isaiah writes, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him as stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned, every one, to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So this prophecy here is about Christ. This prophecy that was written many, many years before Christ was about the coming Messiah. We see exactly how God made Christ to be sin. Christ bore our sin. He carried our sin. He was pierced for our sin. He was crushed for our sin. The Lord laid on Jesus the sin of us all. He was our substitute. Christ was our representative. We can be reconciled because of Christ's wounds and because of his cross. The Apostle Paul paints a very similar picture of this substitution. We find it in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Paul writes... Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How did he redeem us from the curse of the law? Paul says, by becoming a curse for us. Christ became the curse for us. He became sin for us. He willingly stood in our place. And he took the punishment and the wrath that is reserved for unrepentant sinners. We have to see that Christ was completely pure, yet the impurity of sinners was laid upon him. We must see that Christ was completely innocent of all sins, but yet the guilt of all sins was laid upon Christ. He took upon him the shame of all sin that was reserved for all of us. Jesus was so completely identified with sin that Paul could profoundly say, That God made him to be sin. One pastor puts it this way, and I quote, This is what happened on those three dark hours on Good Friday. All analogies and explanations of what happened do fall short, but they provide a glimpse. For example, think of Christ's heart as the sea. 
hemmed in by the mountains of our festering sin. Then imagine our sins coursing down the mountains into his heart until all of the mountains of evil slide into the sea. On the cross, Christ was robed in all that is heinous and is hateful as the mass of our corruption poured over him. Wave after wave of our sin was poured over Christ's sinless soul. Again and again during those three hours, his soul recoiled and convulsed as all of our lies, our hatreds, our jealousies, our pride was poured upon his purity. Jesus was cursed as he became sin for us. This is the work of God, to take the sinless Son of Man and place upon him the sins of all who would believe upon the shoulders of Christ. This, beloved, is how we can be forgiven of our sins. Because Jesus stood in our place as our substitute, as our representative, and he took the wrath that was reserved for us. And as Paul says it, he did it for our sake. Secondly, we see the benefits to man. Paul continues and he says, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now we have to understand something here, brothers and sisters. When we are forgiven of our sins, we have to understand that that's not just enough. That's not just enough. And that might sound a little foreign to us. Because if we are forgiven of our sins, we then stand before God as neutral. Understand something. When we stand before God, there are only two options. Option number one, righteous. Option number two, not righteous. So if we are just forgiven of our sins, we stand before him as neutral. There is not a special third category of neutrality. There's only two options, righteous and unrighteous. Now, here we find in this verse the massive implications as to what Paul is trying to preach to us. It's here in this particular verse that we begin to see where the rubber meets the road. Now, if Christ was your substitute, then your sins were nailed to the cross on Calvary, and then a great exchange happened. God, as we discussed, God took your sins and he placed them upon Christ. But this is the second half of the verse. Christ then takes the perfect righteousness of Christ and then he places it upon you. He places it upon you. When he does that, God declares you innocent of all of your sin. He drops all charges against you and he grants you the gift of righteousness. Paul is telling us that all of our sins were credited to Christ and all of the righteousness of Christ was credited to us. Now this this is not righteousness or perfection that we try to muster up on our own. This This is a righteousness that's not of our own. This is a righteousness that's given to us. Martin Luther, one of the great reformers of the church, he called it an alien righteousness because it's totally foreign to us. We are given the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, brothers and sisters, because of what has taken place on the cross of Calvary, we are declared to have this righteousness. Now, directing our attention back to Isaiah, uh, those first few verses we read really showed exactly what God did, the work of God. Now we see the benefits to man. Isaiah 53, verse 11, it says, Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. Did you hear that? Many are made righteous. Here, here is the stupendous reality of our verse. When God looks down upon you, when you have repented and you have believed, 
When God looks down on you, he doesn't see a vile sinner. He sees Christ. When God looks down upon you, he doesn't see a disappointment. He sees the blood of Jesus. When God looks down upon you, brothers and sisters, he's not shaking his finger saying, why can't you do any better? You're such a disappointment to me. No, he sees the blood of Jesus. What a beautiful understanding of what the gospel is. The gospel, Christ died, took our sin, gave us his righteousness. It's going to be really hard for us to understand. I mean, this, this is a big deal. This is hard for us to wrap our minds around. So I want to do all, all, all my best to be able to help us all understand exactly what has taken place here. I want you to picture yourself in three different scenarios. Scenario one, inside of a bank. Scenario two, inside of a courtroom. And scenario number three, inside of the very throne room of God. So first, a bank. So you're standing inside of the bank. You are bankrupt. Thoroughly, financially ruined. The bank is demanding that you pay up or pay up. In comes Christ. He says, I want to exchange something. I want to give him all of my riches in exchange for his financial ruins. A great exchange happens. So you are now enjoying the riches of Christ while Christ is now paying the due penalty of your bankruptcy. A great transaction. Exchanges happen. Secondly, imagine yourself inside of a courtroom. Inside of this courtroom, you find yourself as the most vile criminal known to man. The judge is throwing the book at you. He is disgusted with you. He's bringing down the gavel. He's going to execute the punishment. And, and bust Christ through the back doors. He said, wait, judge, wait, wait, wait. I, I, I want to exchange something. So what happens is you can enjoy the freedom that Christ offers while then Christ is now paying the penalty of a criminal. Again, a great exchange has happened. Thirdly, I want you to imagine yourself inside the very throne room of God. When you find yourself in the very throne room of God, you find that you are spiritually ruined. You are spiritually bankrupt. You find that you are guilty of every sin known to man. You can't even look at God. And miraculously, Christ comes down from his throne and he takes off his perfect robe of righteousness and he places it upon you. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see somebody who's ruined. He doesn't see a criminal. Who does he see? He sees Christ. He sees Jesus. This is the gospel, brothers and sisters. This is the beautiful good news that we have been given. I want you to, to listen to this one pastor as he sums all of this up. He says, when repentant sinners acknowledge their sin, affirm Jesus as Lord, and trust solely in his completed work on their behalf, God credits his righteousness to their account. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he had lived our lives with all of our sin so that God could then treat us as if we lived Christ's life of pure holiness. Our iniquitous life was legally charged to Christ on the cross as if he had lived it so that his righteous life could be credited to us as if we lived it. All of this works together. The giving of sin and the giving of the righteous, it's intertwined with one another. Look, if Christ wasn't made sin, then we have no security. 
No security in being made righteous, and therefore Christ was no substitute at all. But praise God. Praise God that on the cross, Jesus was our supreme substitute. He took the sin of man and he gave us his perfect righteousness. So it's important for us to understand two things. It's, it's important for us, and it's imperative for us to understand that Jesus not only died for us just so we can be forgiven, but Christ also lived for us so we can be treated as if we never even broke the law. Christ died for us, and Christ lived for us. So let's close our time together this evening, and I want to consider a couple of different things. First, please note that your sins have not been credited to, to Christ, and Christ's righteousness has not been credited to you. Or in other words, you have not been credited, or you have not been reconciled to God unless you are in him. No, that's what Paul says here. He says that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. So the only way that we can be made righteous is, it, is by our faith in him. That's exactly what Paul says in Romans 1.17, that the righteous shall live by faith. So the ones who have faith are righteous in the eyes of God. If you haven't trusted the finished work that Jesus did on the cross... Please understand what John 3.36 tells us as well. That the wrath of God remains upon you. I beg you, just like what Paul did here in verse 20, I beg you to be reconciled to God. I beg you, I implore you to be reconciled to God. And upon your faith, the Bible is trustworthy to, to know that your sins will be given to Christ and his righteousness will be given to you only by your faith. If you guys have any questions, you need to pray with somebody. Myself and the other pastors will be down here at the front after our service has concluded. Please do not delay. Today is the day of salvation. For those of us who are in Christ... I want us to consider the following question. If God has declared me righteous, does that mean that I have been made completely righteous? Let me say that again. If God has declared me righteous, does that mean that I've been made completely righteous? Well, a good litmus test for us to understand exactly how we can be able to answer that question is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, where Peter is now quoting the book of Leviticus, and he says, you must be holy as I am holy. So ask yourself that question. Are you holy? Are you holy? Look, if you're anything like me, then you know the daily battle that rages on the inside. On a daily basis, I do the things that I don't want to do. And I don't do the things that I want to do. So how do we, how do we move forward? How do we move forward knowing that we've been declared righteous, but we know really deep down that we're not morally righteous? Because if we're going to be honest with ourselves, brothers and sisters, we know just how sinful our hearts truly can be sometimes. Inside of the life of a Christian, there is a great tension that's going on. I have been made righteous, but why am I doing the things that I don't want to do? How do we move forward with this? Well, three things to consider, and then we'll be done. First, we must constantly preach the truth to ourselves. 
Never stop preaching to yourself that upon your faith in Jesus Christ that God has forgiven you of your sins. And if God has forgiven you of your sins, then he has given you his righteousness. Do you remember what Christ said at the end of his life on the cross? He said, it is finished. There is no more work for the believer to do on his salvation. It is done. You must constantly preach the truth to yourself. Secondly, we must align our thoughts with the Lord's thoughts. And this is where the discipline of reading and studying our Bibles come in. When we begin to do that, we truly know who God is. His will and his mind will become our mind. The things that make him angry will make us angry. The things that grieve him will make us grieve. The things that he delights in, we will delight in. If you continue to do this, you will gradually be made holy as he is holy. So align your thoughts with the Lord's thoughts. Finally, we must believe in the promises of God. The Lord tells us in Philippians 1.6 that we can be sure of one thing, that he who started a good work in us, he will bring it to completion. With the Lord's help, we will be made more and more like Christ as we go on through the rest of our lives. The struggle with the sin that remains in our heart it will be a burden to us as we are trying to remove it and to mortify that sin. Our goal as Christians is to progressively be made more and more and more like Christ for the rest of our lives, but understand that process will never end in this lifetime. We will continue to struggle with our moral unrighteousness and this tension. But here's the good news. The promise is this. It will end when we stand in glory before the presence of God when we either take our last breath or the Lord comes back. And at that moment, beloved, at that moment, God will not only see us as righteous, but we will be made completely righteous to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Lord, we do love you. We thank you, Father. We thank you for this great exchange that Paul teaches us, that upon our faith, Christ took our sin. And upon our faith and forgiveness of sin, we are given the righteousness of Christ. What an amazing exchange. And you did it for our sake. So Father, we love you. We thank you. Help us to further understand your Bible. Help us to align our thoughts with you. And your thoughts help us to constantly preach the truth to ourselves. And Lord, help us to continue to remember the promises that you have given us in your revelation. Or may you continue to be worshipped this evening. In your name I pray. Amen.